You are listening to a podcast from the University of Eastern Finland, and I am Marianne Mustonen. What does it take to do research in Africa while being mostly based in Finland? What possibilities and challenges could there be? Fred Agbo, who's just finished his PhD, tells us about his doctoral research, which focused on how to teach computational thinking to novice computer science students. Sato Järvinen, on the other hand, has just started her research. The aim of her doctoral thesis is to understand the opportunities and challenges of skills micro certification in Africa. Hi Satu and Fred, it's so nice to meet you online. So Fred, congratulations to our new doctor. How does it feel now? Yeah, thank you very much uh, Marianne for that question. Uh, being a new doctor, it means that uh, we've, I've achieved uh, a milestone that, um, I mean, I feel that um, I've accomplished something that um, is, uh, of course, worthwhile. And um, the, the experience is something that I will look back to and then I would have a lot of refreshment. Uh, but on the contrary wise, that um, there is no such a kind of um, difference from that stage and now because I'm still learning, I'm still developing, and I'm still also doing research. So um, the feeling is somewhat almost the same, but of course I've achieved something that really is worth it and uh, thankful for that uh, um, experience provided by UEF and other, uh, my supervisors and other collaborators. Uh, you are a Nigerian educator and researcher and working in our Joensu campus. Uh, would you like to tell us about yourself and your career? Sure. Um, like you mentioned, I'm a Nigerian educator and being an educator, particularly computer science educator, I'm much more interested in seeing how students of computer science, particularly novices, who do not have uh, experience of uh, computing or programming from their previous um, education, are able to learn at higher education what programming is all about and how to comprehend the concepts of programming. And I utilize um, state-of-the-art technologies and also uh, pedagogies to facilitate their learning. Largely, major um, uh, computer science um, uh, students in Nigeria and also you know, um, in West, West Africa, Uh, in particular, majorly have limited experience in computing and um, they struggle with programming at higher education. And that is one thing that try to provide solution utilizing different approaches in educational technology in order to facilitate their understanding of programming. Uh, why did you choose our university in the first place? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, University of Eastern Finland, particularly School of Computing, um, have a research group that is um, uh, very uh, well renowned and known for educational technology development uh, of uh, tools and, and approaches to facilitate learning, and particularly um, educational technology research group in School of Computing are uh, able to you know uh, provide uh, opportunities for graduate students and also particularly PhD students to conduct their research that facilitate. Um, development, education in developing context. And that also motivated me to um, choose the university and particularly computer science to come and conduct my research in Finland and in UEF. And I've seen that demonstrated over the years because of uh, my uh, supervisors well experienced in um, educational technology development have really guided me uh, in order to facilitate my study within the period that I've stayed and I worked with them in Finland. Thank you. It's nice to hear that. Um, your doctoral research was on how to teach computational thinking to novice computer science students. Uh, please tell us more about that. What is co-designing process, first of all? Thank you very much. Um, Yes, like you mentioned, my research is about uh, co-designing a uh, smart learning environment to facilitate computational thinking education in the Nigeria context. And um, computational thinking is uh, about um, thought processes to facilitate problem solving. And one thing that um, we do as computer science students or learn is about um, solving problems right by writing codes. 
And in doing this, uh, different uh, programming languages have been utilized or, you know, uh, learned in the classroom. But it's somewhat difficult for anyone who do not have experience of programming to, to conceive or to uh, comprehend what programming is all about, and therefore the students struggle with it. Now, one way to facilitate their understanding is to help them to gain computational thinking knowledge, which I, I, I mentioned is a thought process to solving problems. And therefore, when they're able to facilitate their uh, computational thinking knowledge, gain problem solving skills, they could easily transfer this knowledge into the classroom where they learn programming. And it's easier for them to address problems and then not um, confronted by uh, challenges and then they are unable to unravel them. So that is what my research is all about. And I do this by, you know, uh, um, associating uh, pedagogies, for instance, game-based learning, utilizing state-of-the-art technologies like um, uh, virtual reality and also um, uh, different concepts to allow students to visualize programming concepts, gain experience of problem solving, and then they can also take it from, from there as novices. So the, the center of this, this, this study is about allowing students to gain problem solving skill, utilizing game-based learning as, as approach and continual thinking as a as uh, the bed, uh, like the, the foundation for the student to um, transfer the learning and also the skill to the programming education in the high higher education institution. These uh, mini games that you have co-designed with students, they sound interesting. Uh, could you tell more about those? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, I in my research, in my doctoral research, uh, two things are very uh, unique. First is that students learn how to solve problems by co-designing, and also students are able to utilize the product, the artifact that we, we developed, even to also uh, gain problem-solving skill. So the mini games, in this sense, are like um, uh, uh, ways to facilitate micro-learning, and students co-design these mini games with me from the contextual point of view. And during this process of co-designing, they are able to gain several skills like um, uh, creative thinking. They are able to gain skills like uh, collaborative uh, uh, skills, like um, you know, uh, working together to solve problems. And that is a way to facilitate their understanding of problem solving. So students develop mini games, contextualize the mini games, and they also develop ideas that would facilitate or motivate their learning within the context. For instance. A mini game called Mampati Treasure Hunt was developed by, uh, designed by the student, and later we refined it to become uh, um, a high fidelity prototype mini game. Now, the idea be behind this mini game, which is one of those co-designed with the student, is that the students are able to gamify their experience in climbing a, a, a mountain that is located within the university, and what they go to do on the mountain by, you know, trying to unravel. Uh, relics or uh, interesting sites on the mountain. They do a lot of sport on the mountain. And why they try to do that? You know, you know they, they, they allow um, themselves to be engaged in solving certain puzzles, you know, in order to unravel those sites. So until you could solve the puzzles, you are unable to unravel those relics. So this is an idea that students actually associated together and they could actually present that to facilitate their learning. And that way, they have gained some experience of critical thinking. They have gained some experience of problem solving. And also the product, which is one of the mini games in my prototype, facilitate learning also in the contest. What kind of challenges did you have during this research process? Thank you very much. Uh, quite a lot of challenges. I'm doing um, uh, my research was um, user centered, and uh, because we want to facilitate student learning by uh, developing this process with them and also developing the tool with them, I needed the students all the time to conceptualize, um, refine the, the the concepts, even define the requirements for the uh, the process and also the tool, and also evaluate this this tool with them. Now this is a situation where uh, I am in Finland and the students are in Nigeria. So one challenge that we could, we could um, uh, we, that we actually faced was that um, we needed to approach the students regularly, physically, but 
First, we couldn't do that because there was a limitation in terms of resources. Second is that we were confronted with COVID where the, even when we could travel, or the opportunity to meet a student physically wasn't available, wasn't, um, uh, uh, wasn't there. And we had to co-design this whole, whole process online. And that makes us to be innovative in the, in the, in the research itself. So this was somewhat a challenge, but we, we, we work around it to overcome the challenge. And I think that that, you know, a way uh, provided some kind of output that could be transferred to other researchers in the future. So the challenge is about meeting the student physically, which at some point couldn't be, it's not, was not feasible. But later on, we, we, we innovatively handled that and students were also engaged in the prototype uh, development. Thank you. What are your future plans? Well, future plans include to um, still, you know, make the idea that I already have, um, you know, initiated in this research much more um, integrated, which is to mainstream computational thinking education in higher education institution. Globally, this is still a, a, an emerging, you know, uh, um, a field uh, uh, as a process to facilitate uh, novices understanding of uh, programming but particularly in the con- in the context of Africa and uh, West Africa or Nigeria in particular we do not have at the moment uh, computational thinking in the curriculum and my research hope to facilitate that um, it we, we, we have to integrate that in the classroom and that is going to be one of my um, uh, future research that I would also, you know, continue in this line. And also, pr- practically, uh, I like teaching. I like also doing research that is user-centered. And I think this all con- would uh, be part of my future future research. Now that I'm doing the postdoc, and then very soon also going to teaching, I believe that um, these opportunities could be explored in my future as um, I hope to, you know, provide more uh, impact towards Africa and also towards educational contests in Africa. Thank you. Thanks. It sounds really inter- interesting. Uh, now let's move to Satu. Uh, Satu, would you be so kind and tell us about yourself and your career? Uh, well, um, I've been working in, in education for for almost 20 years now and I think my background has been in in really research development and innovations in education especially in vocational education and and digital learning solutions development in that field but due to my background which is that I grew up in in Senegal which is the westernmost country in in Africa you always have to be on top of something so that is the most western um so naturally i've had an interest to to work and do things in closer to my initial home 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 country which is senegal on the continent Uh, and due to that i ended up in my career doing more and more work uh, related to developing vocational education in in the african continent in different countries and then finally moved into being an entrepreneur uh, trying to develop uh, services to, to develop education there and now, now I'm doing my doctoral thesis also related to the same field which is about finding ways to to develop skills and give people opportunities on the on the continent. Mm, your research is just beginning and the aim of your doctoral thesis is to understand the opportunities and challenges of my, uh, skills micro certification in Africa. What is micro certification? Um, micro certification is is sort of a global movement, if I if I would put it that way, in education at the moment. Um, I think what we have come to realize in in education largely is that what we can grasp in, in formal education in terms of, of, of total capacity and skills that we have as human beings is, is only a fraction. Also, we see that, you know, with the technological advancement in, in the world, you know, digitalization and so forth, we need, you know, specific skills at specific times, 
very quickly. So the demand and need for for short programs, micro programs that answer and reply to a specific need is growing. And that we can see, you know, in, in the explosion of of online education providers, your Udemy's, your Courseras and so forth, where you can go and just very quickly, even in the matter of a few hours, you know, learn a specific topic that you need. Um, and that that is part of the micro learning and micro certification movement. Uh, my angle in within that framework is looking into how can we validate existing skills uh, not just learning but especially when we're, we're dealing with people who are part of working life how can we come in and somehow bring to light the experiences and knowledge and skills that they have attained and gained and and in the African context 80 percent of of, of of the continent's working age population, which is, I I think it's it's like the worst and best number because you take an entire continent and give an estimation, so it doesn't apply anyway. It's one of, one of those numbers that it won't be true anywhere. But but a massive amount of population is part of the informal sector, and those are people who, uh, it depends a bit on how 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 they are looked at and or described. But usually, you know, are part of the working life, but. Uh, often have less education, not necessarily that much formal education, but are working, uh, so they have skills, they have knowledge, but not, not necessarily too much formal education or that type of certificates to show for. So that that is really the the population that uh, I am trying to understand and and support and help advance. Uh, what are the next steps in your research? Uh, well, unlike my good colleague Friday, uh, he just finished and I'm barely getting started. So for me now, the first step in in my research is 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 really trying to understand what do we mean by the informal sector. Uh, as mentioned, if if you have a rough number like eighty percent of working age, age people in the continent, that that is a lot. So I'm focusing in two countries, Senegal, of course, and, and Rwanda as another country, so East, east and West, um, and, and, and then trying to cluster the informal sector, like trying to find the different demographic groups within it in order to identify uh, the portion of the informal sector that can most benefit from uh, digital learning solutions. We can assume that there is no one solution or service that could help everyone or or interest everyone. So really trying to find those niches and people that that are most prone to use digital learning services and could benefit from having their skills validated. You already have your own company. Uh, could you tell more about that? Uh, well, uh, my company is is part of my journey. I, I started as an entrepreneur about five years ago um, because I realized that we only live once, YOLO, <laughs> uh, and and I really wanted to put sort of my my work and energy where my heart is, and and with Skills Safari, my company, I have worked in in various projects. Usually, everything is related to um developing either just education like teacher training and such things in, in the digital domain uh, and then developing vocational training naturally more specifically and then to uh, understand and advance also the use of micro certificates and validation of skills on the continent so in a sense you know this phd is very much linked to my also entrepreneurial journey uh, and, and allows me to really understand this challenging topic e even further. <clears throat> Thank you, Satu. Uh, finally, would you both like to say some encouraging words to our young international researchers? Sure. Um, if I may go first. Um, very interesting also that we have Satu working with... Um, um here, here in Finland but working also to develop African uh, particularly 
uh, the vocational sector. And um, I want to say that um, when you look at it from this different perspective that we try to um, uh, address problems within the context, whether it's formal settings or informal settings, one thing is common, that um, developing Africa with uh, uh, research is one thing that actually would should we, we should encourage our young researchers to do and also to engage the users in the development or in their research because it is until you engage them, uh, like uh, Satu said, clustering these um, uh, vocational workers and all that, you would understand what the needs are. You would also be able to provide um, uh, solutions that could address the need of the people. In my case, I try to do that with students, and I also would also um, expand to other stakeholders. And this, I encourage um, young researchers that are coming up or uh, working from uh, different perspectives internationally to also, you know, emulate. And I think that will bring more value to the research we conduct. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more with what, what Friday said. You know, it's 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 very easy to be smart and knowledgeable from from a distance, and and have the solutions. But the closer you get to your to, to the users and and the practicalities, you know, the the clearer you see the challenges, and that's how you can really create something something meaningful. And I think another thing I would I would also say is that we we need to have conversations and dialogue. And and with with many people, like um, I think, uh, what drew me to the University of Eastern Finland was the fact that I knew that I could uh, work with researchers coming from the continent, because for me that's that's the most crucial element. If I want to do good research and be successful, I need to be working with researchers coming from that side. You know, Friday and his colleague to to have value. Um, Otherwise, you know, how could Finnish researchers, you know, solve any problems that that they don't even understand the context of? So, but these exchanges, you know, these conversations where you end up tackling with some, you you always find that you have you have some viewpoints where you're looking at doing things a bit differently, and 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 solving those moments like, okay, so this is this is the truth or the reality there, and this is the idea, and how can we make this work together? How do we cross these bridges? Those are always very interesting conversations, and, and those are the moments that, that really take us take us forward. So uh, th- that would be my, my, my recommendation, in addition to everything that Friday said. <clears throat> Many thanks to you, Satu and Fred. It's been a pleasure to listen to your ideas and thoughts. And I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. You were listening to a podcast from the University of Eastern Finland. I am Marianne Mustonen and our guests were Satu Järvinen and Fred Agbo. Thank you for listening and please join us again.